Thanks for tuning into our podcast. We love having you here, and it's our mission to bring you all the latest and greatest tips, skills, and know-how to make you the best that you can be. We know that you have it in you, and we're going to show you how. Now, now, let's get started. The Marshall. Thank you very much, Panos Papadopoulos. Uh, welcome to The Marshall, episode number three. Um, uh, sorry that I had to reschedule from uh, last week, but uh, I had a meeting in between and, uh, it, I had to reschedule apologies for that one, but thank you for your time. And, um, basically I have read your profile and, uh, you have a very interesting story. I, I mean, uh, you're a Spartan and, uh, you have been in Silicon Valley and uh, you came back to Greece because uh, you want to create a, a good uh, founder's environment and uh, you're a venture capitalist. I mean, tell me about your story because it's very fascinating. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in the 80s in Sparta, which has nothing to do with the ancient glory. You know, it's a modern, uh, you know, small Balkan uh, village town. Uh, I grew up on a time, you know, where my, we used to stay with my grandma and had rabbits and chickens and, uh, of course, there were no computers at sight. I got my first computer when I was uh, 15, uh, internet as well, using a U.S. robotics modem, and I was fascinated. Uh, at that time, you know, I wanted to study astrophysics, but, you know, that wouldn't let me somewhere where I can pay my bills. Uh, so I changed my mind to study computer science instead. Uh, had all the fun the first years at university, you know, when I started actually programming. And I thought, you know, this is what I want to do forever. But on the same time, I was exposed to some notions about company formation and international companies seemed fascinated. Uh, and I wanted like to work in an international environment versus being stuck in what is, you know, the modern Greek corporate system. Uh, so I had my mind into doing something with international uh, customers, doing something on my own, which is a typical thing to do if you come from Greece. Unfortunately, you know, Greek families, you know, they're pushing kids to study and become uh, excellent and have the best grades. But uh, nobody cares about team formation, being like the captain of the football team, as we see in the American movies. Uh, and, I, I, and I suffered from the same mentality. You know, I wanted to do something on my own and just something very little. But anyway, the internet happened. Happened. And then besides the university friends and whatsoever, uh, I, my, most of my influence started to, to stem from Hacker News and Reddit and Stack Overflow. And somehow then I understood what startups are. And one of the startups I joined brought me to Silicon Valley in 2009, uh, where we worked in the predecessor of 500 startups, uh, which was actually an incubator inside Facebook. Uh, so that, you know, was my first passing from Silicon Valley and it was like, uh, I'm eye opening. It was the first time I got to interact with people like, uh, Paul Graham or senior people at Google and being able to chat with them technology while, you know, laying on the floor and eating chips, uh, for someone coming from Europe where we are used to more rigid structures and seniorities and well-dressed people going around and, you know, uh, uh so in their money in your face, it was an eye opening. Uh, so I thought to myself, you know, this is the kind of the world I want to attach to. Uh, so a few years later, uh, after I joined a few fail, failed startups, I decided with one of the engineers, I met John in one of the startups we were working together to set up our own. Wait, so wait, 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 wait a minute. I mean, in how many years you have done all these things? In the, you, you, you went into United States, you went into Facebook incubator, you end yeah. up having so a timeline, company into yeah. NASDAQ. Uh, I mean, in how many years you did all these things? Okay, so the timeline just follows. I was graduating from Arthur's University of Business in... Uh, 2005, I got into research, and in 2007, I launched my first company. I wouldn't say startup because I didn't knew the word back then. It was called uh, Stay in Athens, which was a local Airbnb. Uh, but it was an Airbnb clone because there was an Airbnb back then. Uh, so it was similar to Airbnb, a service that helped exchange students and expats in Athens to find accommodation, furnished accommodation for a few months. Uh, then in 2000. Uh, 
nine, I think, after I did my military service, I went to the startup that took us, you know, to the Facebook incubator. Uh, and then I joined a few other startups, did some freelancing web development. And in, in, in 2011, uh, we launched Baxens with John. Uh, so Baxens was a service that it was geared toward mobile developers, and it helped them understand what is going wrong with their mobile application. Uh, so that is one part of marketing we did wrong. Because if you help people understand what is failing in your application, uh, that's not a very good message. If you help them understand the quality, though, of your application, that's a very different message that you can go and sell you know, to the top executives in a company. So you mean so, that the, the, the first the startup experience of yours, it was yes, a failure? It you was, mean? yeah. I wouldn't say it was my first startup experience, but it was the first startup experience with financing and squarely focused on technology. Uh, we were completely clueless, so I would say ridiculous. Uh, but we were squarely focused on the use case and the customers. So in about two years and a half, we managed to become one of the top three most used tools, libraries for mobile developers. Uh, we had rich revenues of $1 million, and we had customers like JP Morgan, Samsung, Instagram, Groupon, Skype, AT&T, and many others in our platform, uh, which led us to the acquisition of Backsense by Splunk in 2013. Uh, Splunk uh, had gone recently IPO, and today it is valued at $13 billion. It's one of the fastest rising enterprise software wow. companies ever. Wow. And their goal was to bring the mobile capability, you know, looking into mobile applications and, and user experience into the arsenal of tools. Uh, the solution is still alive at Splunk, and it's actually being used by some very large customers. It's very different now than what it used to be, uh, where we had you know thousands of developers. Now it's a heavy enterprise product being used by uh, less developers, but by, at some of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, so I stayed in 2013. I moved to the United States in California, where I worked as a product manager at Splunk for three years. Uh, the first year and a half was quite intense, trying to integrate the company, you know, the assets into the company, but it, it wasn't a company that was understanding either cloud or developers. So the second year I kind of gave up uh, and I had my Silicon Valley HBO moment, like, you know, the yeah. best thing in the wrestling at Hooli. That, I used to good. do exactly that. <laughs> but, but tell uh, me but a little bit more. I didn't enjoy that. So I wasn't enjoying, you know, the, you know, uh, um, uh, grilling sausages in the terrace. <laughs> Actually, our goal with the John was to drink all the coffees that was in the nearby coffee shop. Uh, I think we did it. It was 33 different coffee flavors. Uh, so you can imagine the hard work there. But at the same time, you know, I started doing angel investing and helping some companies, especially with Greek founders, to make it in the, into the U.S. So I invested in 20 companies. Uh, not all of them are big tickets, but uh, some of them are now on the way to being unicorn companies like Shift and Nerx. Uh, and some of the companies like Paul Fish and Balena.io, they have Greek founders. Uh, and now they are headquartered in Seattle and New York, respectively. Both are doing a few millions per revenue per year. They have attracted the national investors. Some top people have joined the board of directors like Ray Ozzi, in the case of Balena. For those who don't know, computer... Uh, uh, com uh, sorry, uh, computer entrepreneurship, uh, technology entrepreneurship. Ray Ozzy was the creator of Lotus Notes, and then he was part of Microsoft. He actually was the, one of the creators of Windows Azure. Uh, so through this journey, I fully understood that I like to work with Greek founders because I know, you know, what is inhibiting them from making big time, which is practically just cultural uh, issues, and of course, access to network. Um, so. I was doing a lot of angel investing, and then George Giralis, which is now my partner at the uh, Marathon, he invited me to come back to Greece and launch together uh, a new fund called Marathon. So many questions. I have so many questions. If I take them one by one, Panos. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I'm very curious about uh, the experience uh, raising up a startup up to 1 million euro revenue per year, or it was per yeah. month. No, it was uh, per year. We weren't that good. 
so you you got an evaluation of uh, around 10 million or something like yes, that. Yes, yes, a yeah. bit north of that, yeah. Uh, it's a very good uh, job well done. Uh, but tell me a little bit about the experience uh, on uh, making a, uh, an annual recurrent revenue of 1 million. I mean, it must be a really hard work. I mean, I have seen it myself. Yes, it's hard work uh, and the- But the most interesting thing is someone that told me that either if you're making a 10 million uh, revenue company per year or 1 billion, it's the same amount of work. Uh, right? So, uh, no, I, explain, it, hours. explain it a little bit I'm to sorry. me. How, how, how is that possible? Yes. I, so, I, the point is, you know, you're going to work extremely hard and pretty much most of your day for both cases. Uh, the question is, you know, have you found a really big opportunity where you can grow a team and delegate and go after the $1 billion dollar company? Or are you going to be trapped forever in the 10 million or the 100 million? Uh, I mean, you're not trapped in 100 millions, right? But uh, in our case, you know, uh, what we're doing with Maxence and having a company doing 1 million might be seem a dream job. Uh, but actually, you know, 1 million is not enough to, to cater, you know, a very talented team. One is that. Or if you do, you don't have resources for marketing. And if the opportunity is big, someone else with deep pockets in marketing, they're going to come into your market. So what happened in the crash reporting space is that there is always like a, spa- a phase of consolidation. Uh, so all the companies that stemmed, you know, from our era, they were acquired by companies like VMware and Splunk and Microsoft, and they became just a feature in something bigger, like, you know, a whole suite of performance management for mobile applications. And then some other companies, you know, they continue the work that we did, and they did a bit deeper and a more technical, and also the market was more mature. Right. Uh, so even though at back for the companies like JP Morgan, uh, a lot of other companies, they will never use a cloud tool, uh, which is not the case three or four years after. Uh, so I think, you know, technology always moves in waves. And there was crash reporting, uh, you know, to monitor the crashes for web in 2010, Exceptional and Hope Toad and a few others. And all of those were acquired for small money. And we got inspired by them to do something which is predominantly mobile. So we did, along with Aptelgen and uh, Crasslytics. So we did, you know, the new Hope Toads and Exceptional that were solving the problems of mobile developers. And nobody else in the world did. No big companies did it at the same time. But then all these big companies, they wanted to get into the space because mobile was blossoming back then. So we knew that companies like New Relic or Splunk with very deep pockets, they will come. Now, one thing I learned, you know, after being an angel investor and a professional investor is that Sometimes if, they, if the competitor is really big and really well-funded, it doesn't mean jack it. Uh, if you're squarely focused on a problem, uh, you will solve it much better than a Google or a uh, New Relic. Uh, because you deeply care about the problem and the personas, and usually it's not the case in the big organizations. Yeah, I, so I, right I, I will now, agree with that one. Yeah, so right now, for example, we saw that, you know, Crasslytics, which was the dominant solution for mobile crash reporting, uh, was acquired by Twitter. Twitter invested a shitload of money into the company. They did the best experience, and then it didn't make sense inside Twitter, and they got acquired by Google, and now Crasslytics is part of Firebase. Uh, But it's not what it used to be. It doesn't innovate as fast. Uh, They don't offer the integrations needed by the community. So another company called Bugsnack uh, that started in the UK is now doing this. You know, they do crash reporting, they are laser focused, they innovate very fast, and they have thought leadership. And actually, I have met with James a few times, and he told me the inspiration for what we do was Bugsnack. And you guys have nailed the UI and so on. Uh, so maybe, you know, if I had enough funding or enough advice, maybe I will continue with Bugsnack and be what, is, what Bugsnack is today, a company that is doing a few millions in revenue, They have raised money from the top investors in the world, like Benchmark and Google Ventures. Uh, but, you know, there are different things, you know, when you decide to exit. One, you're looking into, you know, the opportunity ahead of you, the competition. And also you look inside you. It's like, you know, is the team ready to continue? Or do I feel, you know, this is, I should, you know, hit the pause, uh, take some money on yeah, the table, exactly. a pillow, you know, set up, you know, my life and continue and do it again in the future. That's correct. Uh, right now, there Let- are way more financial opportunities. So right now we see uh, uh, big investors that when they do a Series B round, they give, you know, some liquidity to founders. Uh, and the money they can make on a Series B transaction is equivalent to what will be like a small acquisition. So instead of, you know, taking some money and going work for a company like Splunk, you can take the same amount of money 
and continue running your company. So definitely it's a more favorable environment for entrepreneurs now than what it used to be in 2013 when uh, we got acquired by Splunk. Mm-hmm. Um, may I ask also, uh, the 1 million euro revenue was uh, built uh, based on what, what it was the size of the community? Because the message that I'm getting from this discussion is that uh, uh, there is always a financial reward if you build uh, a good community around one particular problem. So what was the size of the community that you had uh, in Forum? We had 40, 45,000 registered uh, developers and about 1,000 paying accounts. Uh, but I will not say, you know, it was a, a community. There were interactions between the, uh, you know, between the customers. Uh, of course, there was, there was some collaboration on forums or GitHub. But we weren't a community per se. Yeah, but to, to have 1,000 customers uh, paying you every month or every year is, uh, is a community of uh, 1,000 customers. So that, that's a quite, uh, quite good community. So it means that you provide some good quality service in order to create that 1 million. Or you had the, the right pricing. Hello? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, we're back. Uh, do you want me to repeat? Yeah, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> I was saying that basically, uh, most probably, uh, you had a very good service and uh, a quality service in order to attract 1,000 customers to pay you that 1 million euros for the year. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah for- I think we did. Of course, uh, the problem is if you are also a maker of the platform, you know all the bugs, you know all the small things that could be done better. So I was kind of defensive about the product. I wasn't always like, you know, uh, understanding why people are paying because I knew all, you know, things that could be done better. Uh, but we're squarely focused on this problem. Uh, uh, so, you know, when you do that, even if your product is not great, but you're passionate and you can give support at 3 a.m., uh, this is what customers need. Customers actually don't need products. Customers need solutions to their own problems. That's correct. I agree. Tell me more about the uh, Silicon Valley experience. I mean, I have done some uh, years in Silicon Valley as well uh, um, during my Nokia years, but uh, from the corporate environment. So, uh, you know, I haven't seen the, the real kind of like a startup community of, uh, of Silicon Valley as such. Uh, so tell me a little bit more about the, the experience over there. Uh, for sure, it's a contagious experience. You know, all the energy and the willingness to build Uh, is something one has to experience, especially when they're in their younger ages and they have ample time to devote to company formation and technology building. Uh, but in the long term, it wasn't something I enjoyed uh, because right now it has a very strong monoculture around corporate issues uh, and it feels like you know, a religion where everything's about technology and some vague idea of progress. And it's also too fucking expensive. Uh, so even though it's a place to be, and I always try to be there uh, at least once every quarter uh, to connect with peers, exchange ideas, I think right now a lot of things that made Silicon Valley unique, like you know the, the talent of people, the knowledge that has been aggregated, can now is spreading you know, via, uh, of course, the internet. And I will say that Silicon Valley, or at least you know, the romantic notion we had of Silicon Valley uh, back in early 2000s or mid 2000s, has now spread into other communities around the world. It's a state of mind, as several people say. Uh, one could say that right now, Silicon Valley maybe is not the right place for startups, uh, just because you know it has so many strong corporates that they compete for talent and there is a competition for higher prices for everything. And that doesn't make an ideal place for startups that have limited resources. Yeah, and, and I think that basically we see that uh, several European cities, uh, they are um, uh, growing up their startup ecosystems. I have seen uh, the Helsinki one that is exceptionally good, uh, I think is uh, one of the best. Uh, I haven't seen that much of the Greek startup scene. I have seen a little bit of the Berlin scene. Uh, have you s- made the comparison between the European cities, how we are competing? I mean, uh, how Greece uh, yes, is doing? Uh, don't, I don't care at all. Uh, I don't like you know, this kind of uh, emerging nationalism that whatever city is the best or the next Silicon something, it makes zero sense to me. 
And I wouldn't like to see cities that are predominantly uh, dominated by tech, because then you have a dystopian future like San Francisco, where everything's expensive and people are dying in the street and nobody cares. Uh, so I think, you know, the future lies on networks, you know, networks of people. Uh, they can be uh, ex-Stanford alumni or PayPal alumni or National Technical University of Athens alumni or, in the case of Finland, people working at Nokia. So I will say it's more about a certain state of mind than a geographical uh, place. Uh, usually, you know, when you have this geographical concentration, there are a lot of low value efforts like some networking events and startup beers and startup that and start up something else. Uh, people who actually deliver value, they never go to such events. It's a complete waste of time. Uh, and what I see right more and more increasingly is that great companies, they can attract talent just because they want to work on these products, on these problems, on these solutions. Uh, so the, the best companies in our portfolio or other portfolios, let's say companies like WordPress or Envision, uh, they have a global workforce or Elastic that went recently APO. They have a global workforce and they don't hire because they are in Berlin or in Helsinki. They hire because people really want to work in these companies. Uh, and I think that's the most important thing. Uh, right now, you can go into small towns and find someone working remotely for a company like Elastic or Lenses, one of the stars of our portfolio. Uh, and they can, you know, cross-pollinate other people in these, you know, backward-looking places like Sparta, where I, where I grew up. Uh, so I think, you know, opportunity, we were used to say that uh, talent is global, opportunity is not. And I think, you know, we people working on the internet, via the internet, we should make sure to spread this as much as possible. And thus, I hate every startup city and all discussion about startup cities. The point should be like to spread the opportunity as wide as possible. I like the way that you're thinking. It goes back to the ancient Greek, uh, I, who was that? Demosthenes that says, uh, I'm a citizen of the world. So you're having a more networking view Socrates. of... Uh, no, it was not Socrates. I'm, I'm pretty... Okay. Uh, I have, we have to check notes on that one, Pano. Okay. But uh, nevertheless, uh, you sound sure. to me like uh, you are a true citizen of the globe uh, uh, with your thinking. And uh, that is good. Uh, that is actually what uh, I see that the Greek startups, they need. Uh, they need more an external view and not uh, that much uh, uh, the introvert uh, activities that basically I'm observing from uh, here in Helsinki. And yes, so there is one thing, you know, startups that they are kind of uh, trying, struggling to survive. They try to do all these old world things, these events or some press in the local press because that's the most available one, uh, people actually being successful and driving business, they don't have time for these things. So uh, that's a problem with the Greek startups. What you usually get communicated is the ones who are struggling and the ones who have a very wrong view of the world. On the same time, there's a parallel universe of companies like Lenses.io that they have, they land three, Fortune 1,000 customers every month. Uh, there is a pignosis that currently uh, got around from inside venture partners for several, several millions. Uh, there is Workable, there is Balena IO, one of the most uh, forward-looking companies in the edge of in the world of IoT, and, and several others. Uh, uh, for example, yesterday I, I, I learned about a company that just joined Y Combinator, and they do a VO2 max analysis with a device that costs one-tenth of the traditional medical device out there. So, so there are several things happening. Uh, we're squarely focused on those. Uh, yesterday, we also announced our investment in Hack the Box, uh, which is perhaps the largest community of cybersecurity professionals around the world. It's essentially a hacker playground slash training site. Uh, uh, you better, you know, uh, stay tuned to, to hear more about company. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, uh, tell me more about that. And by the way, congratulations to <laughs> Dimitris Tsingos for the Pignosis deal. Uh, it's a good news. I know Dimitris and uh, he's a good fellow. And I'm very happy to hear that basically uh, Talent LMS uh, got uh, a new round uh, for their activities. Um, the most important thing is it is a profitable company. Uh, they have going to have thousands of accounts around the world and financing is, you know, uh, it's not the price. It's 
just you know an enabler. Uh, so first, congrats for making a product that is being used by so many thousands of people around the world. Yeah, and uh, and of course you know that basically I have a competitive platform to uh, Dimitris uh, Eliademy dot com. Okay. So, uh, but it, it, this uh, LMS uh, space in Europe, uh, there are only three. Uh, good players, I will say, from uh, from my point of view, Dosebo, Talent LMS, and Eliademy, and uh, the two out of the three, they are in the, uh, with the Greek founders, so that uh, gives me an extra <laughs> pride, you know. And the other one is in Italian. <laughs> uh, so tell me more about the tell me more about the venture uh, venture capitalist uh, firm that you have. I mean, uh, you have a, a brilliant partner with Taxibit. I mean. The guy, if you were the first guy for the Airbnb, he was the he was the actually the Uber uh, in <laughs> Greece. So you yeah, are, actually you work with the, it was yeah. created at the same time with Uber. So it, it wasn't a copycat. It was you know uh, it was solving a problem of the local market. But back then you know we didn't have you know the expertise and the network to actually help the comp help the company you know scale much faster. Yeah, so George uh, was the founder of Open Fund 1 and 2 uh, that yielded tax a bit and workable, respectively. Uh, we now have 32 million euros and we have done 10 investments. Uh, we still have two companies that have not yet been announced, but one of them is uh, perhaps the largest seed investment in a Greek company uh, that we did along with a Silicon Valley uh, investor, which is one of the billion dollar plus uh, investment firms. Uh, super excited. It's a super popular open source project. Uh, it has traction uh, like no other thing we've seen. And we're super what, what excited about it. What, what, uh, what? It's not yet announced, so oh, I cannot okay. uh, All right. name it right now. So we have 10 investments. On a total, our company is just a couple of years. They are exceeding $5 million in revenue collectively, annually. 60% uh, of them, so 6 out of 10, work with Fortune 1000 customers. And the last two investments we did were pretty much in profitable companies. Uh, so actually the quality and the depth of the deal flow has exceeded our expectations. Oh, that's very good. I, I read recently that uh, Greece in uh, 2018 received somewhere in total 72 million uh, euros in the investments into startups versus 400 euro 400 million euros for Finland which uh, of yes. course I don't know if they <clears throat> if they included the European Investment Bank money into that one because Finnish firms they have got some some pretty good deals from them I don't know in uh, I thought that there is also an allocation for the Greek startup scene from the European Investment Bank have you utilized that uh, fund as well uh, not in our fund no we haven't uh, but there are other funds that have uh, received European Investment Bank uh, financing. We have only received European Investment Fund financing in our fund. And some companies, they graduate, they take uh, directly loans from the EIB, uh, which is a case of Workable, which I think, you know, they secured a quite sizable investment from the European Investment Bank. And the Workable, it was the cybersecurity things. No, Workable, it's a company that stemmed out of Open Fund 2. It's the largest uh, application tracking software in the world, along with two other companies, and that was part of Open Fund 2 portfolio. So I think that basically we have uh, um, the Greek sub startup scene has uh, some uh, good startups cooking there for a pretty good exit deals coming up in the in the coming years. That's how it. Actually, there are. That's how it sounds there's more like. liquidity in the last few years. Last year we had, a, yeah, last year we had seven exits. Uh, the most impressive was the acquisition of Innoetics by Samsung. Innoetics was one of the pioneers in synthetic voice, and so far we have two invest, two exits. And what I'm hitting the last one, uh, the exit of Helic to Ansys. Uh, Helic was a company that helps chip designers create Wi-Fi chips and wireless, uh, wireless chips. It was north of 70 million uh, USD. Uh, and the other company, it's a company called Radio Jar that allows you to run a radio station on the internet uh, via the browser. 
it got acquired by the U.S. conglomerate iHeart, you know, very known from iHeart Radio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and I'm pretty sure there will be more acquisitions coming later this year. I think, you know, acquisitions is not an issue. Uh, what we're really missing at this point is a, a very uh, visible acquisition, something like uh, Salesforce or Microsoft or Google acquiring company in the, car- in the country. Mm. Uh, acquisitors are there. Uh, we just need, you know, one big name uh, that can help more from a PR point of view. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I understand. Uh, but tell me a little bit more uh, about Marathon VC and your activities. Are you focusing only in uh, Greece or Cyprus or uh, East uh, Europe? Or are you regionally focused or continental focused? Or? Uh, so our mandate is to invest in companies that uh, have operations in Greece. Uh, but we are not limited to do companies exclusively in Greece. We're typically looking for companies that has, have at least one Greek founder, so it makes sense for them to have a team in Greece. Uh, I actually have done uh, investments in UK and in uh, Sweden, and usually there is a Greek angle, like at least one Greek, Greek co-founder and some people working back in Greece. But usually what's happening is that even in these cases, the majority of the people will be employed in Greece because there are so many competitive advantages yeah. by having an R&D office here. And the perfect weather plus the food. Yes. <laughs> I miss that much, so much that one. I'm coming 1st of May uh, in Greece. Uh, maybe we should meet also for, for some lunch uh, when I come. That will be great. Uh, tell me about the educational activities. I mean... You know, I don't know how how is the funnel of the of the startups in in Greece. I mean, do we have uh, entrepreneurship? Uh, is there any passion for entrepreneurship for ideas? Is there are do we have incubators, accelerators, and all these kind of things in order to to go forward? Uh, well, right now there is a little bit of everything, and startups have become a part of the mainstream. We even hear the word startup being mentioned in like uh, TV shows uh, and so on. Uh, there are several accelerators and startups and initiatives uh, that they're not of very high quality, but they help spread the word. Uh, I'm not sure you know what is their impact, but definitely we see much better pitch decks and much better companies than what there was out there 10 years ago or what there was 10 years ago. Uh, so I think like the total is uh, net positive. But when it comes to accelerators and incubators, I don't think that uh, there are many of those globally that do a good job because they don't share the same incentives. Uh, There is no risk sharing and usually accelerators can be set for other reasons. I don't know, like PR or corporate responsibility or accelerate corporate innovation, which it doesn't work in the favor of the founders, but in the favor of the corporation. Uh, I think, you know, we typically try to find uh, many negatives in our own ecosystem, uh, but from what I've seen, it's the same in all less mature ecosystems around the world, being Greece or Kentucky or Chicago or Lisbon, usually they share the same problems. And it has nothing to do with corporate structures, taxation rates and so on. It's all about people and their willingness to build things and share risk and share the upside as well. You know, the more, the more I hear you, the, uh, it's very visible that uh, you have a depth and breadth in, 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 in your field and uh, that's very, very good. Uh, what's the future for you? I mean, you are young, you are successful. Uh, what do you want to see happening in the next 10 years, for example, in, in your area and also in Greece? What, what is your vision for for Greece in the next 10 years, and for you personally? Well, you know, that's uh, the, the easier way to, to make uh, fail in something is to make like a prediction, especially for the macro things. So I will sustain from doing macro predictions about Greece because uh, they will definitely be wrong. Uh, so on the micro scale of our venture fund and our ecosystem, uh, things where, you know, we have like a stake, uh, we definitely want to see at least two things happening that will be pivotal. One uh, will be the IPO on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange by a company that started from Greek founders. We're very confident that this will happen and it will be like a unicorn. Uh, we definitely need to build the Greek unicorn. And at the same time, we need to see a few large companies like VMware and Microsoft and Facebook to set up shop here. 
because that will really help with reversing the brain drain. Uh, there are so many great people that left the country, and I'm afraid they're, they won't associate their careers with very big brand names, even though they can have great opportunities in local startups. Uh, at least we want these companies to set up shop here, so it helps you know, uh, reverse the phenomenon of brain drain. Uh, yeah, that is actually a big issue. The uh, this particular issue, I think, is a, is a big one. But uh, uh, what do you do for for that? I mean, uh, how do they, they try to bring back the you know the, the the good, skillful Greeks that they have migrated in other countries? There is only well, on one hand, I don't want them to come back because uh, they get much better expertise and they have exposure to more mature markets. So they have to stay there and lead the business. And the only thing we should do to get them back or what we can do is to help uh, create new amazing companies that people want to work for. Yeah, it's true that basically you can work from anywhere nowadays if you are linked into a particular kind of like a group or a group of people. That's correct. Uh, yeah, that's true. So personally, that's what you want to build, a network of uh, Greek entrepreneurs. Uh, is that correct? Uh, that's absolutely correct. Okay. And uh, do I understand that uh, right, that basically uh, when you started, you are coming from uh, a middle class uh, family that basically you just got educated and then you migrate to US and you made your story, correct? Uh, there was yeah, one error there. I didn't migrate to the U.S. to make it. Uh, we make it. We made it here in Greece, and we moved abroad only when the company was acquired. Ah, okay. Very good, Panos. It sounds like a very excellent career path. Um, um, I'm coming first of May, as I said. It will be great if uh, if we find time so we can meet. Uh, that will be great. I don't know if uh, you have uh, checked into my background what I do. Uh, I have, I'm a founder of Eliademy.com and uh, used to work for Nokia. And I'm also through those podcasts. I'm trying to create a global network of voices of uh, Greek founders, Greek entrepreneurs to learn from each other on uh, how do we go forward. So I would like to thank you very much for participating in the, the Marshall uh, podcast and um, I hope I meet you soon uh, face to face in Greece. Sure, looking forward to you and uh, congrats for the initiative. And I'm looking forward to hear uh, more from uh, great speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Panos. Thank you. Have Bye -bye. a good day. You too.